into uh, this space. Seminar. So today we're happy to have our own uh, student, Frank Cole, uh, uh, just speaking a seminar. He will talk about uh, generation theory for diffusion models. Please. All right, thanks, Yuong, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having me speak. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, diffusion models today. Um, all the work in this presentation is, is joint with Yulong. Um, so before, uh, before getting into the math, um, I'm just going to talk about generative models as they sort of appear in society today. I think maybe the most popular example right now is for text generation, where uh, ChatGPT has become really famous. So it's basically trained on like all of the internet, I think. Um, and it's able to produce some really complex uh, text. Um, I think more relevant for this talk is the image generation. That's really where uh, diffusion models became famous. So uh, they have these text to image generators where you can give a text prompt and it produces uh, an image. So this has been used in, in pop culture, for instance, for uh, magazine covers. Uh, you can create really strange images. Um, and so there's been some debate about the ethics of the image generation and, and AI art, but you, you can't really argue that the, the quality of the samples that they produce is, is really striking. Um, and so that's more uh, pop culture, but uh, generative models have also been used in science a lot. So I think one prominent example is uh, the AlphaFold um, from DeepMind. Um, so that is basically used to predict uh, protein structure. Uh, so this was actually used, I think, in maybe the early part of the pandemic in predicting the protein structure of uh, the SARS agent for, for COVID. Um, and then also in, in medical science, uh, generative models have become very popular. Um, so in, in medical science, you know, deep learning algorithms have already become quite popular, um, but the data to train those algorithms can be hard to acquire um, because maybe it's just expensive or difficult to actually collect, say, MRI data. And also there are a lot of privacy laws that you have to contend with. So, so in this field, people have used generative models to actually create synthetic data that then can be used to, to augment the training of these algorithms. So these are, uh, I think these were generated by GANs. Um, so, so there are a wide range of applications for generative models. Um, and so now for a more mathematical setup, so generative modeling is a, it's an unsupervised learning problem. So you don't have labels for the data. So you're given uh, a collection of samples from some distribution, uh, call it P, um, that you don't have access to. So you don't know the analytical formula, even up to a constant of proportionality. Um, and the goal is to generate additional samples from P. And so uh, per the last few slides, um, the distribution the samples can be you know, numbers or vectors in the mathematical setting, but you can also think of them as text or image data or audio data. Um, so that's the high level idea of generative modeling is you're learning some probability distribution. And a couple examples to keep in mind throughout this talk. Um, so common high level ideas are um, transport based methods where you basically you learn a map um, that takes a fixed distribution, usually a Gaussian, to the target distribution. Um, so things like normalizing flows and, and GANs fall into this category. Um, and then more relevant for diffusion models is learning a, like a Markov chain or a Markov process that uh, whose stationary distribution is the data distribution of interest. So learning a, a Markov chain that you can run to stopping time and that will output an approximate sample from your distribution. Uh, and some examples uh, of the history over the last 10 years. Uh, so I think uh, likelihood-based methods uh, such as uh, variational autoencoders and normalizing flows have been popular where you the training is basically minimizing a KL divergence or, or some bound on it. Uh, and for image generation, I think uh, generative adversarial networks uh, up until diffusion models, GANs were basically the state of the art, and they're still used a lot. Um, so GANs are implicit generative models um, where you have some loss function that's defined adversarially. Um, and then score-based diffusion models are basically the subject of this talk, so I won't elaborate further. Um, 
if there are any questions uh, about the preliminaries, feel free to, to stop me. I'm going to spend a, a decent amount of time on the background before getting to the, the main results. So for, for score-based generative models, it's very important to understand uh, Langevin dynamics as a method for sampling when you know the probability distribution. So it's a different setting. Um, so if you have a distribution on RD, um, and assuming you can say, access it up to a constant of proportionality, then a canonical way to draw samples from P is uh, via Langevin dynamics, which is a stochastic differential equation. Um, if you're not familiar with SDEs, you can also think about it uh, via its time discretization. Um, so, so the basic idea here is uh, if you have a distribution P, then most of you expect the samples to be concentrated around the, the modes of the distribution, is the maxima of the probability distribution. Uh, so the first part of the Langevin dynamics is basically running gradient descent or gradient flow to find those modes. Uh, and usually you use uh, the log density instead of the density itself. Um, for optimization because the scale of the log density is better suited for optimization methods. Uh, but, but if you just do gradient descent to find the modes, that's a deterministic algorithm. So the, the second part is the Brownian motion noise, um, or in the discrete case, adding these Gaussian random vectors with very small variance um, to sort of kick the particle around and to explore sort of all of the state space. So, so this is a canonical but algorithm. A small, yes, a small edge here in the time step. Yeah, small h here is a time step. So this has been well studied. Uh, it's known that the, the distribution of the particle at, at time t in the limit as t goes to infinity converges to, to the uh, invariant distribution. Um, the rate of convergence here can really vary, and it depends on the properties of the distribution p. If, if p has a lot of modes that are very well separated and and spiked, then usually the, the convergence can be very slow. Um, but yes, it does converge. Um, so the problem is in our setting that uh, in generative modeling, you, you don't have access to the gradient of the log. You don't have access to the distribution at all. Um, so you, in order to implement Langevin dynamics, you need some way to estimate the score function. So the gradient of the log is usually referred to in the ML literature as the score. Um, it's not clear uh, in this setup that if you just have samples from P that you can actually estimate this score um, because that's estimating the score function is basically a supervised learning problem. Um, but here you don't have labeled data, you just have the samples. Um, but so kind of remarkably, uh, you can do this and there are several ways. Um, so the, the first method, uh, which is known as score matching uh, is from about 20 years ago. Um, and so, in a supervised learning setting, what you'd like to do is minimize say, the, the L2 error between the score and your estimator over the distribution. Um, and if you just play around with that objective, you can see by completing the square, uh, one of the quadratic terms basically doesn't depend on the parameter value over which you optimize in learning. So you can discard that from the objective. Uh, and then uh, the remaining objective, you have one term uh, who's involves a derivative of uh, P, the distribution. And so under mild conditions, you can use integration by parts um, and move the derivative onto the estimator. And that results in an objective that, that only depends on the data distribution through expectations. So if the objective only depends on the distribution by expectations, you can define an empirical version of this. And so this is known as empirical score matching. You, you have a bunch of samples from your distribution and you have a vector field S theta parameterized by theta and you minimize this objective uh, involving the, the norm of S theta and the divergence. So I, I, mean, I think it's pretty cool that you can actually do this without having the labeled data from the score. Uh, so this first approach, um, it still is used uh, in practice a bit. Um, but one problem is that it can be expensive to compute the, the divergence term in high dimensions. So if you think about parameterizing the score, if you think about S theta as being a gradient of some fixed parametric scalar function, then uh, the divergence term is like a trace of the Hessian, which is expensive to compute in high dimensions. 
Uh, you can also think about if you're using an activation function uh, that's not smooth, then in gradient descent, you're taking basically two derivatives of the activation. Um, so there are some problems with this, but it's still used um, pretty widely. Um, so another popular algorithm comes from the denoising. Uh, so in this setting, you don't work with the distribution P itself. You work with this uh, kind of mollified version of P where you, you smooth it by a, a Gaussian kernel with, with a very small variance, a sigma squared. Um, and on the level of random variables, that means you're taking your sample and you're adding a Gaussian with a very small variance. Then uh, it's well known. I think this formula goes back to uh, Tweedy, I think, uh, in the 90s. Um, but all this is coming from Vincent in 2011, uh, that the score of the smooth distribution uh, depends on this function f sigma, which is the conditional expectation given the noisy sample. And so the f sigma is sometimes called a denoiser because you have information about the noisy sample and you want uh, information about the true sample. And so conditional expectation is basically characterized uh, as the minimizer of the, the mean squared error. Um, so this gives another way that you can estimate the score, which is uh, basically learn uh, an estimator for the optimal denoiser um, and then plug that estimator into the formula for the score. Uh, so this is um, it's a, maybe easier to compute because now you don't have the derivatives of the parameter. Um, the loss is maybe a bit more well-behaved. You're basically just doing regression here. Um, and another benefit of this formulation is the hyperparameter sigma is something that the user can choose. So sigma basically trades off between the, the bias and the variance, right? If sigma is very small, then your sample is very close to the true distribution. Um, but if your data distribution is rough, then sometimes adding some noise as a mollifier can be useful. Um, and you can you can control the error that you incur from the bias um, for small sigma that the in the Wasserstein distance the distribution between the true sample and the noisy sample is about on the order of the the standard deviation. So I guess so far we've seen a couple ways that you can estimate the score function from data, um, and so if you go back to um, the Langevin dynamics. Uh, this gives one algorithm to generate data, which is use score matching um, to estimate the gradient of the log and then plug your estimator into the Markov chain and run it to a certain time. Um, so there are a couple of problems that people encounter with this in practice. Um, so one is that the, the score estimate is only basically accurate in the L2 sense. Um, because you can see, in either case, you're basically minimizing the, the L2 error between the estimator and the score function, uh, L2 over the distribution. Um, and in practice, you're minimizing an empirical version of that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's likely that you're not going to have a lot of samples uh, from the low density regions uh, when you're training. So it's likely that the estimator you get is going to be inaccurate in the regions of RD where the the value of the density is, is low. Uh, and this can be a problem for Langevin dynamics because uh, your initialization is, you know, it's quite likely that you might initialize in a low density region, in which case if the, the error incurred by score matching is quite large from the beginning, then it's it's hard to imagine that your S, the, the sample that uh, returns from Langevin dynamics is going to be very close to the, the true sample. So that's one problem is that the, the accuracy of the score estimator in these low density regions. And then another problem, which was alluded to earlier, is just that the Langevin dynamics can converge very slowly. It might take a long time to run the markup chain before you get an approximate sample. Uh, so there's one method you can use um, to deal with this. Um, which is to take basically a weighted average of um, the density at different noise scales. Um, and then basically for each noise scale, you run Langevin dynamics, and then you take some sort of average of that. Uh, so this is related to the 
denoising score matching. Um, so the sigma i's, you know, as you increase the, the noise scale, you're going to spread the distribution out. You're going to incur more bias. Um, but it's also going to mean that there are fewer low density regions and it's going to speed up the mixing time. So there are a lot of different trade-offs uh, here. And so this is a picture. Uh, this is from the Yang Song's paper in uh, 2019 from, I think it was iClear. Uh, so these are the different noise scales. You can see that uh, adding more noise kind of spreads or, or heats the distribution. So there are sort of these fewer low density regions. Um, so it's less likely that you're initializing in a spot that the trained score estimator hasn't seen, basically. Any other, uh, any questions so far? Yes. I have a question of like, I feel like you don't normally get something for free. So is there like a trade-off as you make the noise level larger? Yeah, I guess it's, you're just incurring more of a, a bias as you increase the noise level, then you're, you're not really learning the distribution that you're interested in. You're learning this, this noisy version. So, so that's a good point. You definitely, don't get it for free. Other questions? So, okay, so I think this uh, this method of sort of adding different noise scales and then taking a weighted average, uh, it leads very naturally into the, uh, the more modern formulation of score-based diffusion models um, that use stochastic differential equations. Uh, so the setup for uh, score-based diffusion models is now you have sort of a general SDE. Um, you could you could make the diffusion coefficient uh, be non-constant. I'm just keeping it constant for simplicity. Uh, and the drift is a fixed function f that the user picks. Um, and the initialization of the SDE is p, which is the distribution that we're trying to learn. So this is something that if you can evaluate f and you have samples from the data distribution, this is an STE you can run. And it turns out that uh, if you take the time reversal of this process, uh, then that's also a, a diffusion process, meaning it also satisfies some SDE. And you can write down the formula for the SDE. Um, so the, the key here is that the, the drift coefficient uh, of the time reverse SDE uh, depends on the score function of the process at, a, at time t minus t. So the, I guess the idea here is the coefficients of the forward and reverse processes are related in that you average the drift coefficients and you get the score function. And so that's the score function of the forward process at time t minus t, to be clear. And then the initialization of the reverse process is the terminal point of the forward process. So in, in practice, um, what you would do is choose the function f so that the stationary distribution of the forward process is something that's easy to sample, like a Gaussian, for instance. Uh, so for the Gaussian case, if you choose f of t comma x to be minus x, then the forward process is exactly the Langevin diffusion for the standard Gaussian, uh, for example. Um, and so if you choose uh, the forward process so that PT is approximately standard normal, uh, then you can think of the reverse process as taking a, a sample of pure noise uh, and turning it into a, a new sample from your data distribution. And that's, that's really the aim of generative modeling. Um, so the, the key idea here is if we can sample from the reverse process, then we can perform generative modeling. And so again, we're going to have to learn the score function. And for that part, uh, you can leverage the score matching techniques that we talked about uh, earlier in the talk. And this is just a, an illustration. Um, so yeah, this is from the paper for Yan Tong, Sol Dick Sign in 2020. Uh, so yeah, as I said, you could consider more general equations where the diffusion coefficient doesn't have to be a uh, constant. Um, so you think of the forward process as turning data into noise and the reverse process is turning noise into data. Uh, and so maybe one thing that might not be clear from this is in practice, you don't actually run the forward process. You just basically sample 
a Gaussian for the initialization of the reverse process and it's sort of assume that it came from the forward process. And as long as you your time interval is, is large enough, then the error incurred from initializing at a Gaussian instead of at xt is going to be pretty small. So um, let's pause and sort of compare with some other generative models. I think in the context of image generation, I think uh, GANs before diffusion models achieve state of the art performance. And I think in some tasks, they, they can still outperform diffusion models. Um, but I think in general, diffusion models exhibit better performance for image generated, generation tasks. Um, and the main problem with GANs is they can be really unstable to train um, because you have this adversarial loss. You have to do a minimax training. Um, and so in situations like that, uh, you can be prone to mode collapse. And really the results are more sensitive to the architecture of the neural network and the hyperparameters of the learning algorithm, like the learning rate and things like that. Um, with diffusion models, the training is basically just regression. So it's it's still not totally well understood for neural networks. It's still non-convex optimization, but it's, it's generally known to perform pretty well. Um, so the, the trade-off here is that the diffusion models do take longer to sample once you've trained, because with if you have a, a GAN, you, you're learning a transport map. Uh, to sample after you've trained the transport map, you just sample from a Gaussian and apply your, your generator. Um, so you basically just evaluate the neural network once, whereas for diffusion models, you have to discretize the SDE. And so basically at every step of the SDE, you have to evaluate the neural network. Um, although I will say that I think for like 2023, 20, 24 state of the art diffusion models, the sampling algorithms that they use take like 10 or so steps to converge to, to really good looking images, uh, which is kind of amazing. Um, but, the, but there is an, in principle, a trade-off here. And then it's also natural, uh, to compare to, you know, standard Langevin dynamics, just learning an estimator for the score of the data distribution and running LD. Uh, so the performance for diffusion models is better for pretty much all the reasons we talked about. For, uh, but the trade-off here is that then for diffusion models, you have to train an estimator for each time step. Whereas for Langevin dynamics, you just learn the score and then you use that for the whole SDE. So it's a bit more computationally expensive to train the diffusion models than to just do vanilla score matching in Langevin dynamics. So, so I, yeah, I wanna present that there are trade-offs here that it's not a panacea. Um, and so I think the question now is, uh, do diffusion models work if you just replace the true score with, uh, with an estimator? And so here I'm gonna present this theorem from uh, uh, Sitan Chen, Sinho Chui and a pretty big group uh, submitted to iClear last year. Um, I think this paper got a lot of attention. Um, so it's about the sampling error for diffusion models. And it's basically saying that if your score estimator does its job, if you have a low score estimation error, then the sample complexity, basically the number of iterations or queries um, that you need in discretizing the SDE, um, to get an accurate sample is low. They have an explicit uh, sample complexity bound. And so the caveat here is that they're taking the, the neural network as a black box that they assume learns the, the score function accurately. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, this result. Um, so it's basically saying that sampling is as easy as learning the score. That was actually the title of this paper. Um, but you can also flip that and say that sampling is as hard as learning the score if you have a complex distribution. So the, the idea here is that this uh, iteration complexity bound doesn't really depend much on the properties of the distribution you're learning, but whether you can get uh, accuracy up to epsilon in training, that certainly does depend on what your distribution is. Um, and for instance, they use, they assume that the score function is Lipschitz. Uh, if you only assume that the score function is Lipschitz, then your sample complexity will necessarily have a 
curse of dimensionality. Uh, but it's, it's still a really big deal, this result. Uh, uh, and so that kind of leads into the setup of our problem, which is trying to analyze the generalization analysis for some tractable class of uh, probability distributions and you know, see if we can derive assumptions that allow the score-based generative models to break the curse of dimensionality. So the, the forward process here, uh, we're just making it a little bit less abstract. So instead of having a general uh, drift coefficient F, we're just fixing the uh, ornstein ullenbeck process. Um, the one nice thing about this process is uh, you can write down the transition kernel uh, very explicitly. You know, the XT condition on the initialization is a Gaussian. You can write down the mean and the variance in terms of T. Um, so it's, it's convenient to work with, um, with this process. And it's also uh, practical um, because it converges to equilibrium very fast. And then this, this formulation kind of leads to this uh, denoising objective, similar to denoising score matching, um, where if you want to learn the score function, the process at time t, you do this variant of the denoising score matching. Um, and then if you want to learn the process over, say, a whole time interval, then you might average this error, this error over t, you know, sum or integrate over t, and then train a neural network as a function of both x and t. S should depend on T as well. It's not just a function of X. Um, well, so the thing is, if you discretize, uh, then you're basically only evaluating the the estimator at fixed points. So, so it's enough to basically. So you can think of it as a function of S and T, but it's also enough to basically think about it as a collection of functions of of X, basically indexed by the time steps. If you're in the if you're in the discrete setting. And in practice, you train this simultaneously, right? The oh. function of space and time. Mm, do do they in practice? Yeah, I mean you got, you don't do this, you know, step by step, right? Yeah, okay. So you can yeah, in practice you can think about it as S also being a function of T, uh, and then the loss would be basically the integral of this over a time domain. Um and so this I, I've kind of done it in the setting where you only have discrete uh time steps, um, but you can also still think about this as just S being a function of T and then SK being uh, the function evaluate that a specific time step. Uh, so this gives basically a recipe to sample from the, the target distribution, which is basically uh, at each time step, you, you have some estimator for the score function. Um, uh, usually you'll do the optimization over some class of neural networks. And then uh, with these estimators, you then simulate the, the discretization of the reverse process with your estimator in place of the true score. And so you have, I've kind of done a, a naive, uh, like a Euler Mariama discretization where you just have kind of a fixed step size, but you can do other things. You can have adaptive step sizes, uh, so on. And so, so this gives a recipe, the sample. At the end of the day, uh, you'll have the final step of the reverse process. Uh, that's a random variable. Uh, and you're basically asking for how close is that random variable to the data distribution? Uh, and maybe more quantitatively, uh, what is the sample complexity? So given, given some error epsilon, is it how many samples do you need to achieve a target error epsilon? So there hasn't been a lot of related work in analyzing the sample complexity of the diffusion models. There's been uh, a lot of work, uh, like the one I presented a few slides ago, saying that uh, guarantees for assuming the score function has been learned accurately. Um, but results for sample complexity, uh, one came out last year, was putting a, a Bezov or Sobolev space assumption on the target density. And if you do that, they show that with diffusion models, you can actually get the, the minimax optimal rate uh, for learning Sobolev or Bezov densities. Um, so there you get the rate that basically can't be improved upon by any estimator except up to constant factors. 
But for estimation in Sobolev spaces, the, the optimal rate has this curse of dimensionality um, in that as the dimension D increases to infinity, uh, the rate gets basically slower and slower. Uh, so it, it's maybe not as enlightening for problems that are very high dimensional, like, like imaging problems usually are. Uh, there's one improvement um, was shown that if the dimension, if the data distribution has similar regularity assumptions, but you assume that it's basically has a low dimensional structure, so it's supported on a subspace of dimension d prime, maybe d prime is like orders of magnitude smaller than d, then you can take the sample complexity to depend on the intrinsic dimension d prime instead of the ambient dimension. Uh, so that's a, a substantial improvement. Um, like for the MNIST data set, maybe the intrinsic dimension would be 10 because there are 10 digits or something. Uh, and so, so that's definitely an improvement. And our goal is now to characterize some way of measuring the complexity of the probability distributions that's not necessarily a dependent on dimension and that leads to sample complexity bounds for diffusion models. Uh, so yeah, as I alluded to before, we need to put some structure on the data distribution. If you don't assume anything, you're not going to get good rates. Uh, so we're gonna work in the absolutely continuous setting. So assume the data has, the, has a density, assume the density is strictly positive everywhere. Um, and in this setting, you can represent uh, the density in this form. Uh, so as an exponential of a minus x squared over two plus some function f, where the f uh, is basically the, the log of the density of p with respect to the Gaussian measure, not with, not with respect to the Lebesgue measure. You can basically solve for f in terms of p, get a formula. Um, and so, okay, why, why are we gonna write the density in this form? Uh, so well, one reason is uh, these densities, uh, this is a practical formulation if you do Bayesian inference. Um, so in the Bayesian setting, uh, this could be a posterior where the, the quadratic part, the Gaussian part is the prior and the F could then be like the likelihood of this posterior or the log likelihood, I should say. Um, and a, a kind of more hand wavy interpretation is that the F is kind of capturing how far the distribution is from being Gaussian uh, in the sense that if the F is zero or, or constant, then you just have a Gaussian. Um, and sort of the distance uh, from being Gaussian uh, in whatever vague sense uh, you want to take it is sort of what's relevant for diffusion models because they're turning the target distribution into a Gaussian. Uh, so we need some further assumptions. And so the key here, the key assumption is to assume that the, the log likelihood F um, has some approximation property for uh, neural networks. So assume that uh, on the local level for, for any ball of radius R, that you can find a network uh, to approximate the log likelihood up to accuracy, I, I guess up to accuracy R times epsilon. Um, and so this, the first inequality alone is not very strong because, because neural networks are known to be universal approximators, right? They can approximate any continuous function up to arbitrary accuracy on a compact set. Um, but what matters is basically how complex is the network? How many layers are there? And what, is the, what do the parameters look like? Um, so we also introduce a norm or some measure of complexity on the parameters theta of the neural network, um, depending on R, the radius, and epsilon, the tolerance. Um, and so we, we'd like to basically say that this constant C, R epsilon is maybe not growing too large as epsilon goes to zero. Um, so I'm being kind of vague that I haven't really specified the architecture of, uh, of phi theta. I haven't specified what the parameters are exactly, but you basically just think of them as the weights. Uh, so I'm going to specify this uh, 
a little bit more. Um, so how we define the complexity of neural networks. There, there are lots of ways to do this. Um, so I'll just recall uh, one definition for shallow neural networks. Uh, so sh shallow neural network, um, if it takes values in R, it's basically a composition of a affine linear map and then a point-wise activation or a component-wise activation function, and then another linear map. So here at theta are the parameters of the network. They're the weights, the biases, and the features. Um, and then if F is a, a deep neural network, you can just say F is a, a composition of functions of the form phi. So the, the norm or the complexity measure that put on neural networks in our setting is basically like an L1 norm of the parameters. Um, so the, the max over J isn't that important, but it's, it's basically saying for shallow networks, you're taking like, a, like an L1 norm of the parameters. Um, you're kind of bounding the Lipschitz constant, uh, but you're also doing something stronger. Um, so why, why is this a good measure of complexity? Uh, so if the, uh, if the, this is usually called the path norm, if the path norm is, is large, then your network is going to depend on large cancellations to get you know, certain point-wise values. I guess you can think of, uh, you can sort of rewrite the, sum of the neural network as a, a difference of two sums uh, over the positive features and the negative features. And so and then if this uh, norm is large, you're basically saying that the component functions are differences of two sums, which are very large in magnitude. So they're very sensitive to perturbations in the parameters. Um, and uh, that basically says that the neural network doesn't generalize well to, to, um, to new data. To, Oh, and I said you can extend it to deep networks uh, in a natural way, um, basically just by writing a deep network as a composition of these functions and then taking the, the product of the norms at each layer. Um, so there, there are other ways to define complexity. Um, I think that one reason why the, this norm is good is because it's, it's very easy to obtain generalization bounds first in a supervised learning setting in terms of this norm. Uh, it's it's easy to they say bound the the Rademacher complexity of the set of neural networks whose norm is bounded by some some fixed constant. Uh, and another reason why it's good uh, in the overparameterized setting is you're not explicitly controlling the number of weights. Uh, so it's kind of been observed empirically that you know modern machine learning works in an works in an overparameterized regime. Uh, so it's generalization methods that require you to strictly bound the number of weights are maybe sort of missing what neural networks are, are doing in practice. And so this norm, it does bound the, it does control the number of weights or penalize the number of weights implicitly, I think, uh, in the sense that, you know, if you have more weights, you're taking a larger sum. So you need the weights and the features to decay faster, but it doesn't explicitly penalize the number of weights. Um, maybe actually more time than I meant to, to spend on this. Um, but so the, the main generalization result uh, is that we assume that uh, P has a, a density um, of the form discussed previously, assume that F satisfies the approximation bound, and we further have to assume that F satisfies some quadratic growth and decay. Um, so the quadratic upper bound is supposed to be very small and the lower bound uh, alpha also has to be controlled. Um, so the, the bound at one four is not exactly sharp, but you do need to control the, the lower bound. Um, then our result is basically saying that uh, given epsilon, given error tolerance epsilon, the diffusion model can produce samples from this distribution up to error epsilon, uh, and we can explicitly control the number of samples that you need. Uh, and so the sample that I've written here, um, there's a constant prefactor depending on dimension. And then there's a rate in epsilon that depends on say the lower bound alpha. You can just think of that as epsilon to some constant. And then there's this uh, a power of this uh, generalization bound C. So I'll just go back to 
So C, get C of R epsilon was basically this, the size of the weights needed to achieve certain approximation error. Um, and so in our generalization bound, you have a, a power of that and you've, we've sort of chosen like an optimal radius to cut off at um, in terms of epsilon. So, so this result, uh, I alluded to this question of the curse of dimensionality and whether the diffusion models can overcome the curse of dimensionality. Uh, so if we look at this, the, the constant does depend on dimension. And in general, it, it's hard to avoid estimates where the constants have uh, dimension dependence. Uh, the rate in epsilon in the first factor is dimension independent though, in the sense that the power doesn't depend on D. Let's say compare that to the sample complexity you see in Sobolev or, or Bezov spaces. And so the question then is whether the the generalization constant, the C, R, epsilon, whether that has some dimension dependence hidden in it, its rate. Um, so I think that's sort of a natural question is, so what distributions can you say that this constant C uh, doesn't suffer from the curse of dimensionality in epsilon? So we'll talk about a couple of examples. Um, so one is a Gaussian mixture. Um, so this is a Gaussian mixture in, in RD with two modes. Um, and so for simplicity of the presentation, I've, I've made the weights equal and I've just uh, let there be two modes, um, but you can generalize the argument to, to a higher number of weights and to different, or higher number of modes and to non-equal weights. Um, and so the question is then how can the, the log density be estimated in this case? Um, and so the, the proposition we found, which, which is not too hard to prove, is that uh, you can approximate the log density for Gaussian mixtures on a ball um, and the complex with a two layer network, or I should say a two hidden layer network, um, a composition of two shallow networks uh, where the first layer basically approximates the density and then the second layer approximates the log function on the image of the density. And the, there's a bound for the complexity of the network that basically depends, it depends on D, um, but only in a, it linearly depends on how small the, the mode is. And then it also depends on basically how fast the density is decaying. So I guess that also depends on the, the smallest bandwidth. So you can think about if the sigma min is very small, then you could have a mode that's very sharp and very separated from the other mode. Um, that's the setting that's difficult to deal with in the sampling case. And it, this kind of suggests that that setting is also difficult to deal with in the generative modeling case. What does the P inverse P minus one? Um, the one over P of X. P is a Gaussian oh. mixture. So then that, that depends on our exponential if you're writing that way. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, you, you know basically what R is going to be from the, the other slide. Uh, and so from the, the previous theorem, we know that um, it only applies to to densities with certain bounds on the tail decay. Um, so it doesn't apply to general Gaussian mixtures. Um, but one example that we have is uh, if you have two equal modes, or if you have two equal bandwidths at one, um, then it's kind of a weird way to put the result. Um, but it's basically saying that the rate can get close to epsilon to the minus 15 um, if you have a lot of data. Uh, so this delta is a parameter that you'd think of as being like one over 10 or, or one over 50. Um, and so you can generalize this to the case where the bandwidths are not equal, um, but we still need the smaller bandwidth to be uh, lower bounded. So you can't have uh, mixtures where the smaller bandwidth is just like arbitrarily small. Um, so, so this sample complexity is, 
it's kind of it's like a minus epsilon to the minus fifteen plus plus some extra. Um, so it is dimension independent. Again, you still have the dimension dependence in the prefactor, um, but the rate doesn't suffer from cursive dimensionality. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. So if the sigma is pretty small, say the distribution has some singularity, also people can use a Gaussian to kind of smear out every singularity, but uh, maybe uh, if the sigma is pretty small, and is there any uh, success, probably, uh, success example show for those cases, the diffusion model can still learn the distribution well? I don't think there's any theory that shows that. Um, there might be empirical studies, um, but I, yeah, none that, that come to mind. I think that, yeah, on the theory side, that's still definitely an open question. That's a good question. Yeah, just a little curious. Why people prefer use the photo variation by the difference? Um, oh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think when you're analyzing the diffusion models, um, I guess KL divergence is, is a natural metric that comes up um, because of the Gerstenhoff theorem for SDEs. It basically says that uh, you can bound the KL divergence between the path measures of two SDEs by the the basically the the difference in the drifts, which is the, which is exactly what you, what you have in the, in the diffusion model setting. So the KL divergence is bounded by the score estimation error, and then total variation is just bounded by KL by a, by a Pinsker inequality. Um, so I think Wasserstein distance is maybe it's a little bit harder to get bounds in Wasserstein. Um, but do you think it can be generalized to some sub diff distance if you consider some embedding? Relation. Well, what do you mean by a Sobolev distance? This is Sobolev norm. Oh, oh, so you're instead of like the L1 norm between the densities? Um, oh, I haven't thought about that. Uh, maybe. I guess you also need to put some regularity on the initial density itself, right? That, that's a good question. I, I haven't thought about that, but um, maybe we could talk more about that offline. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, also when, say, for the second position, so when the PX maybe has something has something value pretty small, close to zero, mm -hmm. and when this cap R is pretty large, it then just means this soup term can be actually pretty large. Yeah, yeah, the soup term can be large in R. Um, so in the previous theorem, so there's some trade-off between uh, yeah, how large of a ball do you want to do approximation on, and then how much of the how fast is your density decay? So how much of the support are you giving up after that? So the, the theorem says that basically the optimal radius to, to cut off on is, is pretty small. Um, and it's kind of close to, uh, if you plug this R into the, uh, into the Gaussian distribution, then you get some dimension dependent factor plus like error epsilon inverse. Um, so yeah, it can grow very fast in R. Um, so to, to deal with that, we have to leverage how fast the density decays. Uh, so that was a Gaussian mixture. The, another example, just to illustrate, it's a little bit artificial, um, but if you assume that the log likelihood is uh, a neural network in a more general sense, um, so instead of writing it as a sum over parameters, you write it as an integral or an expectation over a parameter distribution, um, yeah, then uh, the result about these densities is they can basically be approximated uh, on any ball, and the complexity is sort of controlled uniformly in R by this uh, this so-called Baron norm, which is like the L1 norm of the parameters. Um, in this case, the, the quadratic growth condition is also Kind of satisfied uh, naturally because the real activation is uh, Lipschitz, so the f will grow linearly in both directions at infinity. Uh, so yeah, these uh, so-called barren spaces they they've been studied a lot before because they're basically the natural space for mm -hmm. approximation theory of of relu networks or of shallow relu networks. So you can say on the one hand that barren functions can be approximated efficiently by network by relu networks. On the other hand, you could say that if a function basically has this property, 
where it can be approximated efficiently and the complexity bound can be controlled uniformly in R, then it has to be a barren function. So they're basically the, the closure of those uh, neural networks in this path norm. So it, it's natural then to ask what, you know, what functions do they capture? Um, and so in this setting, um, where you have the log likelihood as a, a barren function, we can say something a bit stronger. Um, so we don't have that extra delta factor here. Um, you have a, basically a better rate in epsilon than for the Gaussian mixture setting. And this makes sense because this is a lower complexity distribution. Uh, there's still a bit of a trade-off in that. You have this factor of the barren norm um, that, can, that can hide additional dependence on dimension, um, but it, is a, it doesn't appear in the rate, basically. So those are two, uh, two sort of concrete settings. It's the Gaussian mixture case is more concrete, but where you can actually get these explicit sample complexity bounds for diffusion models that don't suffer from a cursed dimensionality. Yeah, maybe. Okay, yeah, that's good. Um, proof sketch, I don't need to spend a lot of time on. Um, it's one of the key lemmas was that you can, it was an approximation error, basically saying that you can find a, a network to approximate the, the score uh, in the L2. Sorry, I think I missed a factor of, uh, this should be the L2 norm with respect to PT. Um, and you can bound the complexity of the network in terms of the error epsilon and the time step. So you can think about as T goes to zero, the density, the score might lose smoothness. Um, so it's harder to approximate. Um, and the key idea here was that you could basically write the map from the log likelihood to the score as a composition of simpler functions that, that each layer of the network can, can approximate. And then generalization was a pretty standard argument. Uh, there was a, like a statistical error versus approximation error. And then there was a, a technical detail where we also had to deal with the truncation error because statistical error is kind of hard to deal with with unbounded data. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's about all I wanted to say. And then there's also error due to early stopping. Uh, uh, I, think, I think that's all. Yeah, so just a summary is we talked about sample complexity for diffusion models and when Parts of dimensionality can be overcome. And there are still open questions, like uh, if we can, say, loosen some of the requirements of domain theorem or identify other types of low complexity structure that you know, better reflect certain kinds of data that you see in the real world, like text or images. Um, and then another thing that remains is that we only talked about the estimation from empirical risk minimization setting where you, you have the empirical risk minimizer, but training analysis of uh, SGMs still is left to be done. Uh, I think the, um, that's the paper um, and that's the end. All right, thank you for your time. have time for questions. There's a question from the- Oh, there's a question from the chat. Um, oh, can you go back, please? Did the result imply that the dependence on D in person mention or there's dependent? Yes, um, I can go back to that actually. Um, so I think, you know, Michael's question was about the previous work. Um, so for the Bezos setting, yes, you have uh, the sample complexity is n to the minus s over 2s plus D, where s is the smoothness parameter. And then the bullet below that, it does imply that if you have a a low dimensional structure, the density supported on a subspace of dimension D prime, then the, the dimension in the beds of sample complexity is replaced with the dimension D prime. So I think that answers the uh, question. Okay. Any other questions? Is there a reason why you uh, look at this uh, Gaussian type probability densities? Um, yeah, I guess the two reasons we mentioned were one that uh, maybe it's 
say, go for it. It's natural to maybe consider the densities that you can control the difference between them and a Gaussian. Um, if, yeah, so because the this Gaussian type density is one where the kind of have control on the discrepancy between it, the density and a Gaussian, uh, and they also show up in applications. Uh, like a Bayesian inference is the main. For example, can you uh, can you repeat this analysis uh, in the maybe in a more general log concave setting? That's that's a very good question. Um, I I think you would need new proofs um, because part of this depends on a sort sort of explicit form of the score function that you can derive in terms of the function f when when the data has this form. You kind of cancel certain Gaussian parts in the data and the transition kernel. It leads to a nice expression. So I think log concave setting, you will probably need different tools, but uh, that's a very good question. Any other questions? Okay. Let's have Frank again. Okay. Uh, maybe you should ask uh, more questions from the uh, Thank you. So if you know, that's Georgia. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. You're welcome. Uh, we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.